Good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, uh, we have a treat for you. Um, I will not be preaching, so <laughs> there's your treat. Um, this morning, Josiah Hayden is going to be preaching for us. Um, Josiah is a student. He's also a member. Um, Berean has a long and very rich history of having young guys come to this church, wet behind the ears, and leaving this church and becoming pastors. And so Josiah this morning comes uh, to us as a student, but also as a fellow brother in Christ. So uh, let's welcome him as he opens the word. Well, hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I'm excited to be here. I, it's, the message this morning is something that's been on my heart a lot this week, um, and it's something that I really need to share. And I was thinking even this morning as, as I was coming here and thinking, preparing for the message, when we look in the scripture, love is the greatest of all these things. Um, and Jesus said, if there's one commandment in the whole of everything that I've told you to do in the Old Testament, that that is the most important one. It's that you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. So we're going to talk about that this morning. We're going to talk about love. Especially we're going to talk about how we can love when we get into those tough situations where it, there's nothing inside of us that wants to love. When, when we're on empty, completely, completely dry, how is it that we can love? So if you guys could open to Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, that's where we're going to be this morning. Uh, just a little bit about myself, I guess. Yeah, I, I'm studying at Baptist Bible College. It's a joy to, to be able to preach here for the first time. It's exciting. Um, I come from a, a big family. Um, we've, I mean, big not compared to some people's, but five kids. Uh, and the one thing about my family that makes us unique is my brother, Jareth, has some special needs. Um, now, when I was in high school and and I was faced with those needs, I didn't treat him with love. And that might kind of be a surprise because how you know somebody with who does struggle with things like why why wouldn't I be able to? Well, you know, in the situations that came up, sometimes it was really hard to have patience. Sometimes it was really hard to to be focused on the need more than the problem that we were trying to resolve. Um, and Jareth would tell you that we used to fight a lot, <laughs> which is normal for brothers, but there was, there was constant arguments. Um, but a lot of it was that many times in the moment, love was not the first thing on my mind. And instead of that, it was, there's a problem that needs fixing. And before we start in the Word, I just want you guys to think of something in your life where you might have that same struggle. Some area where you, have, you might find it difficult to love somebody. Um... How is it? How is it that we can love people in these kinds of situations where things seem like there's nothing inside of us that would normally want to respond in love? Like, I mean, what if somebody's taken something of value from you? What if it's what if it's a, something you own? That somebody broke into your house and they ran off with your new TV. What what response do we have to that? Or what if, it's, what if it's more close to home? What if it's your family that gets taken? How do we respond in love when something that precious to us is taken away? What if it's, what if it's our reputation? 
what, what if we're in ministry and, and somebody says something that's false about us and our reputation is shattered? How do we respond in love? We're going to see today in Colossians that God tells us that we need to love one another. As people who have been loved by God, we need to love one another. But in those kinds of situations, how is that, how is that possible? That's the, the question I've been wrestling with a lot this week. And, and Paul does give us an answer to that in Colossians chapter 3. So if you guys could turn there, I'm going to just give a brief context of this book. Colossians is, a, Colossae was a very small city near Philippi. Um, they made, it was kind of off. It wasn't very well known. There wasn't a lot of trade that went through Colossae. It was a small city. And Paul says in the beginning of his book that Colossae, even though it was small, was actually known for their love. Which is surprising because he said, I, you know, I've never been to Colossae. I've never been with you guys. I've wanted to visit you. But I'm thankful in God because I know you guys love each other. And it's just so obvious to the world. And so I guess when Paul's writing in chapter 3 and he's telling them, you know, you guys need to put on love. He's essentially saying you guys need to fan the flame that's there and burning already. And... Um, that's a question I think that would be good to ask us um, as Berean. It, it's, it's something where I, I know we love each other here. I know we love each other a lot. But how can we fan that flame? Where, do, where does our love need to grow? So I'm going to read uh, Colossians chapter 3. And I'm going to start in verse 9 and we'll work through this together. Chapter 3, verse 9. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. (coughs) And above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So, if there's one point that Paul's making here, out of everything he said, the one takeaway, like if there's one thing you guys remember, as loved, as people who have been loved, we ought to, we, we should be putting on love. So, the... the catchy statement, I guess, as love to put on love. It's simple. It's easy. But is it easy? So, let's go down through here. Start. We're going to be focusing on verses 12 to 14 today. Notice how in verse 14 he says, Above all of these put on love. He's listed all these good things that we're supposed to be doing, but he says, above all of these things put on love. So what's why why love? Well like what's the reason why love is more important or significant than humility or patience? Like why above all of these love? Well, the key I guess that I've I've found to that is in verse fourteen he he sa- he says why. He says Love is the uh, love binds everything together in perfect harmony. So we were studying through this. The question came up. Well, okay, does he is he saying that like there's all these things that are good and love is just way better than those things, or or is he saying something more like these things are all uh, products of love? 
So is it is it that love is a separate virtue and it's just better? Like love over patience any day? Or is it love is actually going to be lived out in these things, in patience and, and in all of these other virtues? Well, in in Greek here, uh, one of the, it, it carries this idea of unity. The, this verse here carries an idea of unity. And uh, so the ESV translate it that, translates it that way, you know, binds everything together, perfect harmony. But NASB does a more kind of like wooden literal NASB translation, and it says, love is the perfect bond of unity. So, okay, why is that significant? Well, the word bond there is actually used in a couple other places, and the word bond means like ligament, like the ligaments that connect our bones to our muscles. Um, and this actually leads to a really good illustration of what Paul's talking about here. Um, my grandpa, uh, he, my grandpa worked in a gymnastics business when he was, I think it was when my dad was young, and he uh, would train people and um, how to do these different activities. And there was this one day my dad remembers really vividly when he was there and, he, you know, he's um, doing his routine. And he said he just, he heard this snap. And he looks around and he's like, what in the world just happened? There had been, the, the, there's a guy who was, who was up doing the rings in his, you know, iron cross extended, trying to hold his weight. And one of his uh, pectoral muscles had disconnected from his shoulder. So obviously, he's not holding himself up anymore. He falls down, lands on the mat. His muscles rolled up inside of him. Now, okay, so what, what am I getting at here? Well, I think we, could, we would all say, like, <laughs> that's not, something's not working right. If, if our muscle here is not connected here, there's something seriously wrong. Um, you like, you look at, I mean, a, 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 would a bicep work if there was no connection to the shoulder or to the elbow? No, it'd just sit there. And you might be able to tense it, but it's not going to do anything. Um, and I think that's exactly what Paul is saying about love. Our body wasn't made to, to work each bone not connected, this just joint disconnected. The, the body wasn't designed to work that way. And in the same way, we were never designed to have patience without humility. We were never designed to have humility without compassion. And we were never designed to have anything without love. And <coughs> love is the key. Love is what actually allows all of these other things, which, which are good things, to actually work in the way they were meant to work, in the way that they were meant to function when God created the world. Um, just a way to illustrate that, if you guys could turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13. This is the, the passage on love, and we're going to go through this. And just look for, look for how all of the things that Paul was talking about in the other passage, patience, humility, compassion, meekness, look, look for how those things are associated or connected with love in Corinthians, okay? So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, start in verse 1. Paul writes, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels... But have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, if I die for my faith but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. 
It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Down in verse 13. So now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. It's, it's clear that all of these things are connected. It's, love is fleshed out. It is lived out through our, the way that we interact with people. When, when times get hard, are we patient? Or when, when, when we're up in front, are we, are we humble? These, these are all ways that love works itself out. And the question I guess I want to ask, though, is like, we all know that's true, I think. But what about when love hurts? And we get into those situations where it doesn't seem like we have any ability inside of us to love. How is that possible? If you go back to Colossians 3, turn back here. Going down through this, uh, verse 12. So, we're supposed to put on compassionate hearts. Well, what about when you're interacting with, with unsaved people? And I know a lot of, a lot of you guys here work in, in unsaved environments or go to a school where there's not a lot of believers. There's going to be things, obviously, that come up that are going to be very hard to wrestle through. Because unsaved people are unsaved. (laughs) They don't have the love of God in them, and they're going to say things and do things that hurt. How how do we react? Do we react with compassion? That's hard. Um, What about kindness? Your translation might say goodness. Goodwill in, in your heart. What about when there is no goodness or kindness shown to us? What then? How do we love in that situation? What about humility? It's hard for me to be humble. Uh, I struggle a lot with humility. And there are times, especially put in leadership roles, I was just in charge of a BBC's talent show, and it's easy to let stuff like that get to our heads. We're just prone to that sometimes. Meekness. Meekness. Uh, it's pretty hard to be meek sometimes when we see somebody struggling with a sin that we don't have any problems with. Or what about patience? Uh, us college guys, we're all, we're all pretty tired. <laughs> it's hard to be patient when we're tired. <laughs> what about when your kids drive you crazy? <laughs> you know, they just disobedient, obedient, they're pushing that button that they know is... You know, in the moment, in that moment, are we being patient? That's not easy. Um, it says we're supposed to bear with one another in love. When it gets hard, though, what about when, when we're trying to love somebody who's just unlovable? How, how are we supposed to bear with somebody who just, there's nothing there that would make us want to love them? And what about forgiveness? It says in verse 13 that as the Lord has forgiven us, so we also must forgive. But what about when our reputation is destroyed? Or somebody takes something of value from us? How, how are we supposed to forgive in those situations? How, how can we do that? Well, this is where the passage here can give us an answer to that question. In verse 12, remember, he said, As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on these things. Down in in verse 14, he said, As Christ has forgiven you, you also must forgive. The key 
is as people who are loved by God put on love. We cannot love until we have been filled with God's love. It's impossible. We might be able to love in a small way. We might be able to have patience in a, in a small way or in a, some sense of it. But when the thing gets us right at the core of who we are and it and, and annoys us in that moment, we're not going to have patience if we don't have God's love. It, it, if it's forgiveness, we might be able to forgive up to a point, but there's no way we're going to forgive certain things if we do not have God's love. The thing about chapter 3 here is it comes after chapters 1 and 2. And if we look back quickly at chapter 2, we're going to see that all of this stuff about love is coming out of something that Paul has said already. He's already established earlier. So in in, in chapter 2, verse 11... says in him in Christ also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead and you you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. It's hard sometimes to love. But just try to picture in your mind how much harder, I mean, than anything you've ever gone through, it must have been for Jesus to love you or to love me. Think about his mercy, his compassionate heart. When we were slaves to sin, when we were living as we're saying, sin, you're better than God. I'm going to let you be my master. And we were living that way. God chose to come down and save us from that. Was it just a whim of his? I don't think so. He had compassion. Isaiah 53, I love the verse... All, all of us like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Sometimes I, I feel exactly like that. I'm, I feel like a stupid sheep. And it's really easy for me to, to lose sight of what, who God is and just run off and wander about somewhere that he doesn't want me to be. And I think... When, when God looked down at us, he, he saw that we had no hope. We, we think about the fact that our sin separated us from God a lot, but there's that element, yeah, but he also saw that we were, we were sheep that had no hope of finding the right way. There's nothing there that we had. And he had compassion on us, and he sent his son to die for us. And well, mercy or compassion, that's a, a feeling maybe towards us. It, like we said, he, he came. He, he, that was lived out in kindness towards us, in grace, in actions that he took towards us. Um, the word here for forgiving, forgiveness, is it's not the idea, there's two kinds of forgiveness. There's forgiveness of I'm going to forget what you did to me. And there's forgiveness of I'm going to not acknowledging what you've done for me, I'm going to give you undeserved um, friendship. It's it's that kind of it's the the gracing forgiveness. 
and he had grace on us, and I, I don't deserve that. Do you? He gave us grace in the form of forgiveness. And to do that, he had to humble himself, too. He had to take on the form of a servant. He had to come here and be one of us. He had to be humiliated, spat on, beaten, crucified. He had to he had to humble himself all the way to death. This is God humbling himself all the way to death so that he could so that he could show us mercy. And then think about his patience towards us. Because yeah, he was he was patient because he withheld his wrath. And he didn't just strike us the minute we sinned. But we're still sheep. <laughs> we still wander. And and when we do, think God is compassionate and he's patient. And he waits as we do our own thing. And he has he has he bears with us day by day in the ways that, that we fail and sin. This this gospel, this good news is what's behind Paul's discussion later. This um remember at the beginning of chapter three he says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, put on love. All of this. If you have been raised with Christ. That kind of love, that's not something that we, it doesn't make sense to us. Because it's not a human sort of love. That doesn't, there's nothing in us that can manufacture, that can find that kind of strength in love. It's so foreign to us to think about forgiving somebody who's hurt us that much. Or showing compassion on somebody who seems to be unworth loving, or or having patience in all these situations because we don't have God's love in us naturally. I I kind of like to think of God's love kind of like a cup of water. You know, if if this cup is um empty and it's down really low what's going to happen if somebody comes up and jostles it well probably nothing um, there's a chance that maybe I could pour out a little bit of water if, if it was way down and, and I really tilted it over there might be a chance it would splash out if we're trying to love we're, we're trying to do all these ways that God has taught us to love and we're running on empty with God's love, understanding what He's done for us, thinking about that, filling ourselves up with His love, there's nothing that's going to spill out. If somebody comes up and does something that offends us, or somebody steals from us. But if we're full, all the way full, it could be the littlest, silliest thing. It could be the hardest thing. No matter what happens, if that cup gets hit, we're gonna water's gonna spill. God's love, if we're full, it's gonna come out in, in all of these areas. Whenever there's there's any sort of thing that's tempting us to to, to not want to to have patience or or to be humble the natural thing that's going to come out is the love of God that's in us. Because we're going to be full. As people who've been loved, we can put on love. Because we have been loved. So, which of these areas of love then presents the greatest struggle to you as you seek to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because I think with each of us, we all have our own 
area. I struggle with humility. Um, some of us might struggle more with patience. But where, where do you need to fan that flame in your own life? To where, where is God's love running on empty? Um, if you have been thinking about a situation in your life, well, how, how can you respond to that situation with love? Um, what, are some, what are some ways that people have wronged you? Um, do you need to show them compassion? Jesus showed you compassion. He showed me compassion. Is there an area where you need to forgive somebody and you've been holding on to that? Well, it's an evidence, yes, that forgiveness isn't rooted in your heart as much as it should be, but it's more an evidence that you're not full to the brim with God's love. And when I am... And when I'm having struggles with pride and, and blowing myself up or puffing myself up, the real the real problem isn't that I'm just got a big head on my shoulders. The real problem is I don't really understand God's love enough. Because if I did, I would be way more focusing on those other people than on myself. If I was full with God's love, if I had let that sink into my heart, it would spill out. With with my brother Jareth, um, it was there were rough points for us. Uh, before I had that love in my heart, things were hard. It was difficult. It was not easy. But because because of what God has done for me, and because I've started to understand that, that has changed radically the way that I interact with my brother. And I love him more than anybody. I mean, as much as anybody else I know. Because I've started to understand God's love. That didn't happen before I got saved. Before I, I started to understand God's love, that didn't happen. I was not showing him love. I was impatient. When things got hard, the thing that came out was not patience. It wasn't until I started to understand God's love and He started working my heart that that was able to change. If if our cup is full, we are not going to be able to help loving people or continuing to love. Because we have experienced something that is not human. Something glorious and bigger than ourselves. And when when we have God's love in that way, it's just gonna it's gonna be like lighting the the pile of wood on fire and everything is gonna be affected. It's it's gonna pour out of us. Because it's not this is God. This isn't this isn't me. It's something bigger than me. What would it be like if Berean Baptist Fellowship fanned up the fire of of our love in the areas we needed to, in our community, in in our country, or at BBC in our school, or in our homes? What would it be like if if we, like the Colossi Church, could say, somebody would say, yeah, I've heard about you guys. They talk about you in in Florida for the way that you love each other. You're known for your love. It's evident. It's it's pouring out of you. You know, if, if Baptist Bible College became this area where we are known around Pennsylvania for the way we love each other. And I think we have that a little bit. I mean, we, we do because God is working here and He's in us and God is at, He's doing amazing things here. 
in, in BBC and in, in Berean, but how much more could we love each other? And what would that look like? I think if we were known for our love, the biggest thing that might happen is God would receive glory. Jesus said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. If we loved one another the way that Christ loved us, in all of our areas, and if we if we filled ourselves up daily with the love of Christ, and we meditated on it, we let that be our hope? Well, how much glory would that give to God? What, what does He feel like when we, when we override or overlook His love and go about our daily thing? When we say, oh yeah, 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 we're saved, we're saved. And, and then we go about living when we don't fill ourselves up with that. What is, what is that like for Him? That's not the way He treated us. If we love one another, it's going to... It will glorify God in amazing ways. But, are we known for our love? Or are we known for something else? Father, it's easy for us to be it's easy for us to be known by the gifts we have, by the abilities we have. It's easy for us to be known by the groups we're in, by the people we associate with. It's easy for us to be known by the ways that we conduct ourselves and in on, online, on our social media, and the way that we, the, the things that we enjoy. But God, we know that the Greater than all of that, and the only thing that really has the, the lasting importance is, is our love for one another. And we want to be known for our love. Lord, if there's any of us here today who are struggling to find any sort of way that they can love one another, if it's, if it's patience, Lord... Teach them about the patience that you showed them and showed me when, when, when we were wandering, when we were far away from you. Lord, if, if somebody is struggling with compassion or having mercy on somebody, forgiving somebody, show them your incredible and deep grace and help them to understand that that's how you love them. Lord, we, we run on empty so many times. It's so easy to just default to running on empty. Because we're busy with our own thing. We're like stupid sheep who, who think it's not important to stay by the flock and to, to be comforted by our shepherd. And we go off and we, we try to have fun and... Or we're just totally against you and opposed to you. But in all of these situations, God, we know we know that you'll bring us back because you love us in that way. So please give us um, give us hope today, and and when we're struggling and when we're down, please comfort us and and increase our faith and increase our understanding of your love because, Lord, we want to be known for our love more than anything else. I pray all of this, Lord, in your name because you're the one who died and who rose again and you're the one who's given us life. Amen.